mediums, minimal soul down. My body and soul got a heart full of gold. They can never hold me down and keep my name on the low. Hell. This is the E-NASCAR College iRacing Series. Big drinks for a big problem. The cars may be virtual, but the racing and scholarships are real. fans and welcome to iRacing's coverage of the eNASCAR College iRacing Series powered by Nace Star League live this evening for the virtual Talladega Super Speedway in Lincoln, Alabama. James Pike alongside Blake McCandless here and Blake, we have never been here before in the College Series, but you combine any sort of NASCAR vehicle at Talladega and there is one word that you can use to describe this place, chaos. Yeah, that is true, James, and especially with the C NASCAR College iRacing Series, I think we've kind of become accustomed to seeing a lot of those same names up front that have really staken their claim and won a lot of this scholarship money in the past. But the one thing that Talladega provides, perhaps more than any other track, is opportunity. And I think throughout this field, we have several key contenders that have been a part of the E NASCAR Competitive Series ladder and many drivers who have been on iRacing for a long time. And I think across the board here, there is opportunity opportunity for all of them to try and run up front and win this scholarship money and take it for themselves tonight. This is a place where we may see a new winner as well as we take a look at where we've been and where we're headed in the series schedule for 2023-24. We started at Daytona, then went to Charlotte, Dover, and Watkins Glen in the fall, opened up the spring at Michigan, Darlington last time out one month ago, Talladega tonight, Nashville on April 16th, and then the championship race from Homestead Miami Speedway Friday, May 4th. Third to round out the season, right around exams at the end of the spring semester for most colleges in the United States and Canada as well. So not too much longer to go in the college series season, but we have some notes to take care of. We have a Coca-Cola track analysis to look at. So play McCandless. Let's learn a little bit more about Talladega Super Speedway. Well, it's pretty simple, James. 2.66 miles around this highly banked 33 degrees in the corners. The long Alabama gang super stretch down the back straightaway and then 33 degrees of banking on the other side of the racetrack in turns three and four. A trioval that can be tricky at times at just 16 and a half degrees of banking and that changes with that bottom lane as well through the trioval. And of course, the start finish line that is towards turn one that'll provide us some fantastic finishes. And of course, it was Casey Kerwin back in 2023 that ended up winning at this racetrack in the next gen car in the eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series, but a totally different game in these trucks. They punch a huge hole through the air a lot of draft. Let's take a look at tonight's starting grid for race number seven in the college series this season. Edward Sanchez out of Baruch College is the pole sitter with a fast time of 56.190 seconds. He's joined on the outside of the front row by Ohio State New York's Matthew Morton. Garrett Bitten, the Sun Devil from Arizona State, rolls off third alongside Eastern Washington James Cioli. Austin Farr from Liberty starts fifth. John Forbes Jr. from Saddleback College starts sixth. In row four, you'll see Daniel Nanny from Ball State University alongside Lane Graves representing the Shockers of Wichita State. Dylan Alt for Sacramento State will roll off the inside of row number five. Hopkinsville Community College represented by Nate Stewart to round out the top 10. Alexander Hyder from St. John's River will roll off 11th and C.L. Smith representing the War Eagles at Auburn will start 12th. Rolling off in the 13th position, it's Zach Sprouse from George Mason University. Jonathan Evans out of Western Connecticut starts 14th. 15th is Austin Green, one of the many Embry-Riddle drivers we've seen in the College Series. Mario Miranda from Oklahoma starts on the outside of row 8. San Jacinto's College's Abraham Vela starts on the inside of row 9 to his outside, Benjamin White from Pensacola State. 
Back in row 10, another Tiger represented here in Reese Baham for Auburn, as well as uh, Kaloha Hankins for UNC Charlotte. 49ers represent on the outside of row number 10. Kelton Quick, another Ball State entry here, will look to be quick, starting from the inside of row 11. Logan Clamp at Cal State Fullerton, a favorite here, but at Talladega, he's just one of the crowd. He'll start in 22nd. 23rd tonight will go to Chris H. Bryant from Methodist College. Uh, in North Carolina, as well as Jack A. Clemens from Virginia Tech on the outside of row 12. Anthony Burroughs is Coach Series Experience representing St. Charles Community College. He starts 25th alongside Wingett's Brandon Schulenburger. Aaron Mulrooney Jr. from Kent State. The Golden Flash starts 27th. Garrett Lowe, UNC Charlotte, one of the contenders for the series title, starts 28th, 29th is Auburn's Landon Velucky and Aaron Brown from Eastern Shore Community College rounds out the top 30. The Lancers will enjoy a bid in the NCAA tournament for Jeremy O. Burns representing Longwood as well as Caleb O'Brien from Missouri S&T. He'll start from 32nd tonight. Charles Wembley for Guilford College roll off from 33rd. Back at 34th, you'll find Elliot White with the Terrapins of Maryland University. Back in row 18, Enas Car Coca-Cola iRacing Series driver Daniel Falkingham representing Maine at Makius as well as Matthew Zwack from Michigan. He'll start from the outside of row 18. Final three drivers are second Emory Riddle driver and the inaugural winner in the college series, Colton Salick, Jose Solis Jr. from Manchester Community College, and Colson Phelps, the Iowa State Cyclones, champions of the Big 12 in men's basketball and a two seed in the tournament kicking off this week, rounds out our 39 car field. Before we get going, Blake, let's take a look at tonight's Logitech G race analysis. Pretty straightforward here tonight, James. 60 laps that these drivers will have to compete. A pit road speed that'll take you down to 55 miles an hour, but getting there is awfully tough when you might be going as much as 200 off of turn number four. Uh, you'll lose about 34 to 39 seconds if you take four Goodyear Eagles, which I don't imagine that that's gonna be the case if we arrive there under green flag conditions. But just in case there are four sets of Goodyear Eagles available, as well as that pit window, James, it's looking up about 33 or 34 laps that these trucks can try to make it on fuel, which should just put us past uh, the halfway point of this race. So imagine we'll see if we get there for green flag conditions, one pit stop in the midst of that cycle. That was the key that I was about to make. One pit stop, no matter what happens, potentially two, depending on where the cautions fall. We've seen some of these restricted plate races in the college series be two stop races. We've seen some of them be one stop races. It just depends on whether or not they get into it. And when they get into it here at Talladega, you're going at minimum 170 miles an hour. And that can be very, very tricky. Glad you joined us here on iRacing and eNASCAR dot com forward slash live for race number seven of the 2023 24 eNASCAR College iRacing Series powered by a Starley green flag is out and Edward Sanchez leads them to the start finish line. We are racing at Talladega. The outside line already getting just a little bit of momentum. Matthew Morton's already eked ahead by about a car length over Edward Sanchez, but Blake Battle even itself right back up as they enter the corner. Right now, just trying to see if they can try to get something forming in either lane right now. Haven't seen anybody try to venture up three wide, except there is just one truck that's gonna try to do so before ducking back in line. Just trying to see what numbers they can build. And I think for now, it looks like a high speed pace lap, but just trying to figure things out as it looks like lap number one will go uh, to the man that's set on the pole in Edward Sanchez, but on the outside, trying to form a little bit of, of a head of steam out there. You'll see Matthew Morton representing the Ohio State, trying to drag along that 27 truck right with them off of turn two. He's in that second lane or the middle lane now because Nate Stewart out of Hopkinsville Community College, the Kentuckian, is making that third line work, and he's got help from Mario Miranda, the Oklahoma Sooner. Those two working in that third lane, they're all by themselves, but they've managed to do a decent job of it. They're already moving up the pecking order a little bit. Stewart's already cracked the top ten, and they're about the third or fourth truck in line on the outside. 
you know, this is something that, you know, I kind of figured out running in a couple of races in the eNASCAR Road to Pro Qualifying iRacing Series is that outside in this third lane, you really can get one truck, maybe two, if you're committed and you're able to carry a lot of momentum. And if you're drafting really well, you can make a move like what we're seeing on the outside here for Nate Stort. Just two trucks strong on the top side, but they've made up a number of rows. Nate Stort started back in the 10th position and is already up to nearly leading that outside lane. And I think you can see a couple of trucks in the back, James. They're starting to see how well it's working, and they're going to try to join the fray up here to see if this third lane can perhaps go up and clear this second lane. Go on board with Auburn's Logan Smith out of Hayden, Alabama. Local race for him. You know, he'd love to get a victory here this evening. But uh, worth noting, I think, that it's not just two drivers in that top lane in Stewart and Miranda. It's two drivers that have extensive experience in official races and private leagues on iRacing. I've seen those two run up near the front all the time. And look at Garrett Lowe just peeking out to the outside as we cut away from that onboard shot. He has already found his way up to the front. And I think what we're seeing, Blake, is that that third lane really is beginning to materialize, especially for those who might have started a little bit further back in the field. You can imagine Garrett Lowe trying to make up just about anything he can in terms of the points. He has about eight that he's trailing right now in the series championship to Logan Clampett. So the UNC Charlotte 49er trying to do everything he can to find a couple of points. And this is going to be a race, James. Uh, when you talk about the, the battle for the championship, we know how strong somebody like a Garrett Lowe, somebody like a Logan Clampett is when we go to these other racetracks, Nashville Super Speedway being the next one up that you're going to see a lot of these drivers at the front of the field. This is an opportunity race. We mentioned it at the top of the show, but I think for a different reason, too, that if you're Garrett Lowe, you're looking to make up eight points, this is going to be one of your best opportunities to do that here at Talladega because you pretty much know everywhere else that Clampett and some of those drivers uh, that are also a part of the top of the standings, Holy Solis Jr., Nate Stewart, Matthew Morton, they're going to be strong every other track we go to. So if you're looking to make up some points as we see Nate Stewart get shuffled out of line there for a moment this is going to be the track where you want to do it at had a good on board look there with edward sanchez just a moment ago the first time we've had a representative from baruch college in the college series here on iRacing. James Scioli now in well was in control of that outside line, and then Sanchez decided to slide up in front of him. So Sanchez now the Pine Piper up top as we go on board with Ball State's Daniel Manning, the Cardinal representing the Mid-American Conference and, and the extensive esports program that they have built at Ball State. They definitely done a great job of trying to incorporate iRacing into uh, the many different esports uh, that are a part of that organization at that university. And right now, Daniel Naney just kind of chilling out right now. It's about the fifth or sixth truck right there on that inside line. And, you know, this can be a really difficult position to be in, James, when you're trying to look and, and see where you can go. And in fact, Naney's got a little bit of damage on the on the nose of his number 30 truck. You no, know, it, it's somewhat difficult to see from the shot that we're on right here but it looked like he had a little bit of contact i'm not sure if it's with that truck that's just in front of him uh in john forbes for saddleback college or if it was a, a little bit earlier in the going but nanny doing as best as he can i think trying to manage with just a little bit of damage on the nose as we move back to zach sprouse just a little a bit further back you can see dylan alt just in front of him representing S sacramento state uh, but Sprouse and everybody, at least right now, just trying to get through these opening few laps at the moment. That's an important point that you make about Nanny's car because I can confirm that he does have damage on the front end of his truck, and that means it's not quite going to be as easy for him to lead one of these lines because you'll have a little bit more drag on the front end, and that'll make that truck slower in a straight line and all by itself. Look at the rear of Austin Forrest's truck as well, the 79. You can see damage on the rear end of that truck too, so I wonder, given that the rest of these trucks look clean, if those two may or may not be connected. Maybe uh, we might be playing a little, uh, I, I guess, Sherlock Holmes to figure out what's happened here, Blake. <laughs> well, let's see, maybe if that's the case, uh, as we see kind of that third lane that was at least looking to form there for at least a period of time uh, is starting to falter away a little bit. And James, you could take a look at, I think, uh, the mentality of a lot of these drivers. We kind of see the you know the differing thoughts of whether you're going to go up to the front you're going to try to lead all the laps you're going to try to contend for the win or if you're going to be riding around you see a long line of trucks from about 20th on back that are single file behind this pack 
just trying to get to what may be a green flag pit stop as uh, we get a good look there at the 82 of Caleb Bryan representing Missouri S&T. Again, running at about the 17th or 18th position, but he's going to have a, a challenge on his outside from Benjamin White trying to build up a little bit of steam. We mentioned that third lane. You definitely need the numbers to go up there and make it work. Is oh, a big move just happening right there in front of Caleb Bryan. See, what a lot of folks at home don't realize is that this is our producer Drew Adamson's dream shot because not only do you have a Ball State truck just ahead of him in Kelton Quick, and that's where Drew went to school. He's a proud alum of the Cardinals. But you have the Missouri S&T paint that he loves so much because it uses chrome. And Drew on his personal paints usually runs a lot of chrome as well. So a cool looking truck, cool looking machine, and I think just hanging out in the back for the moment, which is about the strategy from everybody about 20th on back. They're much more bunched up at the front of this field, but everybody else for the most part, Blake, if you're 20th on back, they're all riding single file, trying to stay within touching distance, but also making sure that they're far away enough to where if they wreck up front, they've got time to slow down and avoid the chaos and the carnage. Well, and I think you saw kind of a, a move where Caleb Bryan was kind of assessing the situation and saw it was Zach Sprouse for George Mason that got awfully loose in the middle and kind of checked up the middle line. And I think you saw Caleb Bryan and a couple of others uh, who saw that it was nearly an accident as he got spun off the front, nearly got spun off the front bumper of another truck. And they said, all right, you know what? I think I've seen enough. Kind of the, the Denny Hamlin-esque move that we would see. You know what? I don't believe that this may stay together too much longer i'm going to try to go to the back and preserve uh and try to survive here past the opening 10 laps of this race of which we'll complete when we come around this time by um, but it is one thing about these trucks james they've changed a little bit in i racing over the last couple of years and being able to bump draft is something that has become much more difficult i would say over the last year or so with some of the damage updates that has taken place uh, and we'll see if uh, everybody's willing to kind of ride up front around here and continue to be aggressive up front. If you want more updates for the world of eNASCAR, scan the QR code on the lower right hand portion of your screen for news, information, results, and more courtesy of iRacing, the official simulation partner of NASCAR. As there was a big move there from Benjamin White. He only just cleared the front bumper of James Scioli and it is lap 11 if you're keeping track of things just over a sixth of the way through proceedings and that was uh, uh we know we've got some folks in the iRacing world that like to use the phrase big meaty moves that was a big big meaty move because it almost saw benjamin white get turned in front of the field entering turn three well and he, he very quickly has the lead but he'll lose it to austin green and now he's going to elect to go to the bottom and the one thing we've seen from benjamin white he's made every lane work he's gone to the middle we saw him work the top side that's how he was able to get the race lead and even kind of went to the bottom there in turn one before jumping right back up to the middle uh, in turn two and trying to keep his advantage out there and you know at least when you're out front here james i think that's kind of where i would prefer to be riding that middle lane you can pitch down to the bottom and kind of side draft that line back and control it a little bit and you're not often having uh, to fend off the battle for the top lane we've seen it work a couple of times if three or four trucks really get rolling up there uh, but it kind of eventually dies off when whoever the leader is goes back uh, goes back uh, to the middle lane and down to the bottom but Benjamin White kind of playing all the lanes here and we kind of see the the differing of these two strategies we see a lot of trucks that are kind of waiting things out and looking to see if they can make some moves toward the end what would be the end of this run uh, but Benjamin White's doing the polar opposite strategy he wants to control this race he wants to learn everything he can in the draft and try to make some moves as well we have trouble 27 of James Scully around in front of the field the caution is going to come out Nate Stork gets a piece of it as well as a bad bump in the center lane sent him into the outside wall and about four or five other trucks at least get some significant damage out of this one and on lap 13 James caution flag at number one out here tonight at Talladega First caution of the evening is Scioli got a bump. I think that may have been from Garrett Lowe, but went right around in the middle of the back straightaway. And at that point, when you're traveling that quick and the trucks are that close together, there's not much that you can do. As Scioli goes around and about four or five others got damage in this. We saw Nate Stewart go around. I think Zach Sprouse may have gotten a piece of this. Aaron Brown also, I think, just escaped 
not a lot, but Scioli definitely the one who came off the worst out of that incident. Also, Lane Graves, the Wichita State shocker, also involved in the incident. Benjamin White avoided it, and I think that was part of the strategy, too, of trying to run up front as we take a look at the replay and see what happens here. But if you're White, the idea is to stay up front and control everything so you don't lose the track position, so you're not behind stuff like this. As you see the bump there from Garrett Lowe, and then Scioli bounces his off Matthew Morton. Miranda has nowhere to go. Graves gets turned. The 40 machine, I think that might be Kealoa Hankins in there. All of them get caught up in this, and we'll take a look on board Abraham Vila's machine, the San Jacinto College student. We'll see what he saw. He was right near the middle of this. Miranda, we saw, had to check back up as he only spun. So we'll see the bump just a little bit to the left to center of screen, and then there's the only turning, and he just <laughs> missed that plate. That is, there's perfect timing, and then there's that. Yeah, there's a little bit of luck, and of course, if you ask him, well, he, he did everything he could to, to miss it, and it's all skill, and, you know, Abraham did a great job there, but that just goes to show you, we were talking about it a little bit earlier, how sensitive these trucks can be is uh, getting a bad bump there, and again, Scioli was getting some help from Garrett Lowe. Garrett Lowe was just trying to get that center lane moving and going forward, but just the little bit of the slightest bump in the wrong direction. And again, wasn't center when he made contact with that 27. Sent him into Matthew Morton on the inside and uh, unfortunately gets turned around there. But uh, again, we've seen these trucks are pretty forgiving in terms of damage and it, you may not be able to lead a line, but you can stay in the draft if you get enough of it repaired. See a couple of trucks that'll make their way off of the pit lane here. Some differing strategies going on in terms of tires, in terms of fuel as well. I imagine most of them would probably fill up at this juncture and be able to go to what would be just past about lap 45 or so uh, at this point in the race if we were to ride things out. Uh, to the green flag but it looks like first off of pit road just as he entered is going to be that number one of benjamin white also worth noting that about the top 10 ish drivers and there were a few others further back but some of them took two tires instead of four so most of the field took four but some of them took two and i think part of that plague is because with the way this caution has fallen, with the way, or with where we are in the race, rather, we still have just over 35 laps to go. That probably is too much for most of these drivers to make it to the end on fuel. They're almost certainly going to have to come in again. So, actually, check that, excuse me, 45 laps to go. Uh, but still, definitely not enough to be able to make it. So these drivers are going to have to stop twice. And to the point that we talked about earlier at the beginning of the broadcast as to whether or not this could be a one-stop or a two-stop race, now we know almost for certain that with the way this caution has fallen, it's a two-stop race for everybody. Well, it's going to be one stop from here to the end. But what I'm kind of curious and, and looking to see is if there's going to be kind of a pack of trucks that – elects to do something a little bit different here do you try to make it to lap 30 or just beyond lap 30 where you you think you're good to be able to make it on fuel and try to pit in a big pack again with all this money on the line james we know there's different teammates different alliances going on but you don't see significant groups of people or friends that are going to be committed to one another to try these strategies out and they're so important we see it all the time especially in this next gen era in the nascar cup series you think of manufacturers that like to pit together that's not going to be so likely. Not only do you not have a ton of groups of friends out here, but look how much money is on the line, James. I wouldn't want to push my friend to get him $1,000 of scholarship money when I would want that money if I was in this position right here. You can see all the way through the top 10, there's something on the line for these drivers. And uh, I know if this was available when I was in college, I wouldn't have helped anybody else <laughs> to try and get some scholarship money for myself. Knowing you and how fast you are on the sim, you probably would have paid for half your tuition with this money, I think. Because I would have expected <laughs> you to be a contender pretty much every single week. You, uh, you certainly would have been better than I would have been, though. I certainly would have tried. But yes, uh, almost $4,000 in scholarship money that we're going to give away over the course of this evening to our top 10 finishers in 60 thousand dollars in scholarship money over the course of this season so uh, the majority of it already handed out we're already clear of 30k in scholarship money throughout this season but still a few more opportunities to go top 10 all will receive something at the end of the evening and, and to the point you made earlier blake about this being a race of opportunity especially for those that might not necessarily 
necessarily be towards the front of the point standings. This is an opportunity for drivers who wouldn't necessarily have the speed to win at like a Michigan or a Charlotte or somewhere to go out and, and maybe get a few hundred dollars of scholarship money because things at Talladega are just so much more even. That's not to say that plate racing doesn't take skill. Of course it does, but uh, there's a lot more randomness that gets involved with these plate races and opportunities for a lot more drivers to win. It's definitely a skill. It's just a different skill. And I think you can see that uh, on the entry list as well, just the diversity of drivers that we have in this field. Again, it's time attack that these drivers have to do just to qualify for this field. And especially for these super speedways, they're as competitive as anything with all the money that's on the line. Benjamin White leads us back to the green flag as we begin lap 17 of 60 and round seven for the 2023-24 eNASCAR College iRacing Series here at Talladega. White to the inside, Austin Green representing Embry-Riddle to the outside as they come back up the full song and to the back straightaway once more. White didn't get the great pushes that he was looking for, at least on that inside line out of turn two. It's going to allow Austin Green to be able to clear himself down. He takes the opportunity to do so and takes the race lead. However, that Arizona State Chevrolet that is just behind uh, that leader of the outside line and John Forbes, uh, Garrett Vighton, has been incredible so far early in this race, really being a good pusher, kind of hanging out in the kind of the third or fourth line on the outside or row on the outside line. You could see how attached he's been able to be the 11 car, or 11 truck, I guess I should say. Uh, but again, that really helps. And with how the draft works here, James, especially with these trucks, it's usually the second, the third, the fourth trucks in line that kind of decide, okay, how is our lane gonna move? As Vighton tries to clear back down and oh, he got a little bit of help uh, right there just behind him from the George Mason uh, Silverado, because man, that was uh, Zach Sprouse lifting to let Vighton back in line. We talked about how great he was shoving. Well, you, you gotta look in your mirror and make sure that uh, you're not leaving the door open either to fall to the back of the pack. I can appreciate Garrett, especially given the mascot on the hood of his machine, trying to give a spark to that outside line and I will see myself out the side door there. That, that was that was low hanging fruit, no <laughs> doubt. But uh, to your point, yeah, you either have to be careful or I wonder if he's feeling the pressure from Zach Sprouse enough to where he'd rather just sort of back out because he thinks that Sprouse may end up pushing a little bit too hard and maybe he ends up turning John Forbes the same way that we saw Scioli get turned just a few laps ago. Yeah, I think that was more of an intentional move, not a, hey, I, I got out of line and I'm trying to keep my place in the middle. Sometimes you have that where if you're not so comfortable with some of the drivers that are around you that are pushing, uh, well, maybe sometimes the best thing to do is to go to the back of the line and try to just refocus, find a way up there and uh, see kind of that 42 take that evasive maneuver right now. And again, he's joined by a long list of cars that are doing so just behind him. Watch the right side of your screen. You're going to see it again. Uh, that's the first time. In, I mean, golly, that James, I don't know. You probably couldn't have fit a sheet of paper uh, between that truck and the 42 as they nearly made contact uh, in something that would have been very similar. But I think you can see it is definitely uh, kind of calming down a little bit. As it was about 20 trucks or so that were battling up here at the front, two and three wide. Uh, that's starting to shrink a little bit. It's about outside the top 15. You start to see a lot of trucks that are lining up in that bottom lane and think that it's going to get crazy up here and with the way that outside line is forming it definitely is starting to pick up a little bit i think that vitten sprouse moment was a big reality check for a lot of this field because if vitten turns any more to the left and starts spinning across sprouse's nose that's almost guaranteed 20 trucks taken maybe not out of the race outright but probably out of contention with the damage they would have received so we were five minutes to midnight on having the big one right in that moment and instead everybody else for the most part backed out of it and John Forbes has now gone to the outside as we'll go on board with Matthew Morton in our Coke on board this evening.
We're looking off the deck lid of Austin Green, one of our two drivers from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. And, and maybe fitting that you see uh, the radar shape of a hurricane on that rear deck lid because we know Embry-Riddle. Yeah, yeah, I was about to say you, Of course. <laughs> throw that out there. Uh, yeah, no, that, that tracks, that tracks. But uh, we know Embry-Riddle for their aeronautical prowess. So a lot of aviation programs end up coming out of there. They produce a lot of airplane engineers, but they also have a meteorology program at Embry-Riddle, which given that you're right on the coast in Daytona Beach, you're basically right next to the Speedway and, and you deal with hurricanes uh, every once in a while there. Uh, it seems a little bit fitting, I think, that there's a hurricane on the back of that truck. I think so too. And uh, I don't know, it's seen a lot of crossover. I mean, what we've had several meteorologists or so compete in the NASCAR. What was it, Keegan Leahy uh, before? Wyatt you know, Tinsley. Moved? Wyatt Tinsley yeah. also into that too. Before moving over to 2311 to become their sim driver, that was his hope was to, to be uh, on that side of things as well. So, yeah, a lot of crossover here in the sim racing world uh, with that discipline. And uh, has it, you know, looking good. It's representing that discipline well as Green was leading that inside line. Now he's on the outside and looks like he'll lead him to the strike once again. Also worth mentioning here as we go off the back of Rancho Santa Margarita's John Forbes that the first ever winner or rather, the first ever plate winner, excuse me, uh, of a college series race on one of these big tracks was Colton oh, Salick, who's also in this field. But uh, picked up the victory in season one at Daytona, so they have tasted success in the Edascar College iRacing Series before. As I see John Forbes up here, another point that I think is worth bringing up, we talked earlier about Benjamin White trying to avoid wrecks by staying at the front. Just with the way Forbes has worked the lines and maintained the track position, I think it's safe to say that Forbes is another one of that handful of drivers that wants to stay up at the front throughout the entire race so that all the wrecks happen behind him and not in front. I think you could say the same about Benjamin White. And in fact, he and uh, Austin Green just about had a moment uh, there on the back straightaway. And we've seen that a couple of times where you think you get on the back stretch, everything's okay to try and shove that truck in front of you as hard as you can. But again, if you're not aligned perfectly, it is so easy to get that truck in front of you upset, especially if you're that third truck in line. But you can see when it works, it works well as Green is gonna be able to clear down to the bottom. And I think we saw it again, James, that as soon as he could get clear, he said, I don't want Benjamin White behind me. He is pushing pushing and shoving for all he is worth, and it's brought that one truck to the front, but I may not be so comfortable uh, with that truck kind of hanging out behind me and perhaps uh, getting me in a bad situation. As we can see, Jonathan Evans, uh, a long ways to go that Evans has uh, up the road to try and catch back up to the field of New Fairfield, Connecticut. And you can see a little bit of communication going on. I'm sure just counting the laps and trying to see exactly when you would want to come in. And if everything uh, is to play out in this run, James, that's what a lot of these drivers are doing. They, they don't have their hands full right now riding in the pack. They're able to talk with their teams or crew chiefs or spotters, which many of them have out here tonight about strategy and perhaps forming some plans with some other drivers to try and, and pit at a certain point in this race. Jonathan Evans representing Western Connecticut, making both his debut in the college series and also the school's debut in the college series. So a big night for them, big night for him, potentially a little bit later on as we carry on and watch these two at the front. It's Austin Green and John Forbes. Benjamin White is there too. Uh, maybe not everybody wants to sit in front of Forbes and have him or, or Benjamin White push, but Austin Green, for what it's worth, seems like he's been able to handle the bumps, handle the runs, handle the drafts, and handle the pushes better than most of the drivers that have been up there so far. Green's jumped back up to the outside very quickly goes back down to the bottom. Surprisingly, we haven't seen anybody, at least in the last handful of laps or so, there hasn't been a single truck that's really been willing uh, to go all the way to that third lane to try and make up some time. Uh, starting to see a couple of drivers, some of our E-NASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series drivers that haven't really tried to make many moves. You can see them just way in the background of that shot uh, that are riding back in about the 31st, 32nd position or so that are trying to at least make something happen in that second lane. And I think have kind of uh, decided at a certain point, hey, maybe maybe riding around is not going to cut it anymore. Maybe we need to start trying to get up to the front. So you have 
kind of two lines up here at the front of the field, about 10 cars deep, the inside and the outside row. And then you have to almost go back to 30th before you see some more trucks that are trying uh, to get that outside lane for them. It makes me wonder with the way everything's strung out, if we might see that pack at the back start to close that gap just a little bit to the back of the front because there's not really much connection for a lot of the trucks in the middle. It's only about maybe the top 10, but they're, they're pretty spread out. Once you get to call it Kilo Hankins, Brennan Schollenberger, about 13th, 14th in the field. It's not like they're trying to get up to the front, but if you've got all that head of steam uh, from the rear and you go all the way back to about Jack Clemens, Charles Wembley, that's where that second pack you're talking about starts, then maybe they might compress things. Who knows? We'll see. Also just heard a call over the radio, kind of the first time that this happened tonight. Uh, and it is something that these drivers are having to think about, and that is managing the oil and the water temperatures in these trucks. You can see that 86 George Mason machine uh, that just called out of Zach Sprouse. He said, I'm hot. I have to I have to duck out of line. I have to be able to cool down. You know, that's something that, especially in these trucks, we don't often think about, but it's certainly a part of why you don't see that you'll see a little bit of shoving from time to time in these trucks, but you can't stay glued onto that truck for very long in front of you. And exactly being that, that you can get that, that water temp just a little bit too high. And the last thing you want to do, especially up here at the front of the field, is blow an engine and take out a majority of the field if that were to happen. So uh, it, it's something that these drivers definitely have to monitor. And about fourth or fifth, you know, truck in line, you're not necessarily having to worry about that. But especially if you're that second, you're that third truck trying to get those lanes moving, uh, it's going to be tough. And that's something you're going to have to manage for sure. We are half a lap from approaching the halfway point of tonight's race and you get a good look here at mario miranda's machine as we approach the halfway point we're going to take a commercial break and get some of our words from our favorite partners in the way before we come back to bring you the second half of action from talladega you're watching iRacing's coverage of the enascar college iRacing series hey, did you see that Woo! hear that Feel that. Is this how you prove you earn the crown? Winning is in his DNA. How you shut up the haters. I love it. Handle the heat. Who's going to make the move? It's going to be a must win. Is this a shooting star? Rock star. Superstar. Okay, okay. Let's all take a deep breath. Because once we peel out, there's no looking back. You ready? Every time you sit behind the wheel, you buckle up for the unexpected. You get ready to take on the competition, embrace yourself for the chaos, the speed, the weather, the unknown. But above all, when strapping in, you put trust in yourself, your intuition, making your guide to win, your drive to win. He's a winner in this. And nothing is going to stop you from winning. I hit the wallet, this thing shook like crazy. I have experienced that in real life, so I can compare. I tend to choose rally games that are really putting the actuators through their paces and they've been holding up really well. That's exactly how it is in real life, that's the coolest part. March is Women's History Month, and NASCAR is proud to recognize the accomplishments of past and present icons within the sport. From drivers like Sarah Christian, the first woman to compete in a NASCAR Cup Series race, to track presidents like Julie Giese, Lori Collier Warren, Natasha Causey, and Jill Gregory, the women leading the venues in which we race across the country. All of these women have helped pave the way for future generations. We are proud to celebrate them and all women year round.
Tonight's broadcast of the eNASCAR College iRacing Series is brought to you by Coca-Cola Zero Sugar. Is it the best Coke ever? Try and decide. By Logitech G. Through design, engineering, and a love of driving games, Logitech G takes racing simulation to another level. Logitech G, the official wheel and pedals of the eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series. By D-Box, make body and racing simulator become one. Improve your virtual race time with D-Box motion technology, providing ultra-precise movements and vibration cues while racing online. D-Box, feel it all. And by NASCAR Women's History Month. March is Women's History Month, and eNASCAR is proud to recognize the accomplishments of past and present women in the sport. The contributions made by these women to the sport should be celebrated as they help fuel NASCAR's past, present, and future. Welcome back to the eNASCAR College iRacing Series at Talladega. James Pike, Blake McCandless here as we've just crossed over the halfway point and we have seen some of the drivers in this field come down pit road under green flag conditions and more of them now as Austin Farr and John Forbes lead about 10 trucks to pit lane for what should be their last stop of the night, Blake. And it looks like one truck just flat out missed the entry to pit road. That's Colson Phelps. Uh, who did not make it down to the commitment line for Iowa State. So it looks like he's going to have a pit road entrance penalty. And this was pretty much all created, James, that we had about a pack of 10 or so trucks that pit uh, two laps ago. And everybody else saw the quality of the drivers that were a part of that pack and said, well, the numbers are too great. We're going to have to react to that and react to it quickly at some point. Uh, as you can see, we're already well strung out here, single file and most of the field has already elected to pit. So you kind of have two options. If you're formed up here, you feel good about the time you can make up. You're going to stay out. But as you can see, many of them don't. And I think this is going to complete the green flag pit cycle for the most part. As you can see, Logan Clampett able to make up some time on pit entry. It looks like everybody else gets down to that pit road speed of 55 miles per hour safely. And we'll see where this all shakes out and who's able to cycle up to the front. Again, green flag pit stops and super speedways all comes down to execution. We'll see who executes here. So now we have some of the trucks that have come down pit road beginning to come back together and reform into one pack. Everybody that you see on your screen, we believe, has come down pit road for service. The rest of the field is just now coming off of pit road. You'll see them get past here just in the corner of the shop. That there's that long string of trucks that just came down for service last time by. So we'll see how much time they lose compared to the trucks who stopped maybe two or three laps ago. There will be some catching up to do. However, Blake the Canvas, if we get a yellow for whatever reason, the trucks in the back may be in the best position whatsoever because they will likely not be a part of the wreck. They'll probably be too far away to touch it. They may be able to gain some track position back, but they may also need a yellow to have a chance to win this race. Yeah, I think at this point, it's definitely all about track position. As you can see, that 87, remember, he kind of led them onto pit road. He was able to maintain Benjamin White's a little bit sideways as he gets a bump from John Forbes Jr. And they're going to go around the 10 truck just behind your race leaders. They are still green, though, as he goes spinning through the grass off of the racing surface. That is not going to bring out a caution as Aaron Brown collects it back. He'll get rolling onto the racing surface, but looks like we are going to stay green for now and again keywords Blake you just said them off of the racing line if that truck had spun back up to the outside wall immediately that's a yellow but if that truck spins to the outside and it's out of the racing line off of the main racing surface I racing will not throw the yellow flag so we stay green flag racing and what that's done Blake is that really has separated what was going to be about a 20 to 25 truck back it's now maybe 10 to 15 that are in this front line I'd say right around Mario Marone the Garrett Fitton, Kaloa Hankins. Those are about the last trucks in this lead group, but everybody up here for the most part now single file. 
You're going to have a couple of trucks that are able to form up behind them, but whether they can make up the time, that's going to be it. And you have a couple of trucks, Garrett uh, Vitton being one of them, uh, Hankins in the 72, just trying desperately to hang on to the draft of this lead pack uh, to try and make sure they stay with it. 21 laps to go, and we were talking about it. The track position is the name of the game. Is Falkingham going to make a bid to the outside? Again, he hasn't been a factor at all in this race, was hanging out in about the 33rd position, and the entire higher lane is just going to abandon Benjamin White. He falls back six or seven trucks in that outside lane. New leader up here at the front of the field is Daniel Falkingham, patiently been biding his time all night long. And with 20 laps to go, he's at least going to lead the inside lane, but he's not going to lead around to the stripe this time. It'll be Garrett Lowe for the Charlotte 49ers who has it at the stripe. I wonder perhaps if everybody else has seen just how strong Benjamin White has been all night long. And if they said if there's an opportunity to get him shuffled out of the front of one of these lines, let's take it. Here's the blend on the right-hand side of your screens just a few laps ago. And watch John Forbes, the red 11 truck, forces his way through the middle, just about gotten to Daniel Falkingham and found room where I did not think oh. there might have been some. And then there's the spin that the 10 went through of Aaron Brown. He's the one that got sideways and spun down into pit road. So. A very, very hectic moment there. It just about got hit by another truck there in the back as well, did Aaron. But that was very scary and, and typical of the mergers that we see at Talladega. That's not uncommon for the difference in speed to create incidents and create problems for people. Well, again, I think that's just a moment for Aaron Brown. He's four wide. He's trying to get back down to the middle line. And just before he's able to cut down, he was not quite clear of Garrett Lowe, who, by the way, didn't seem to be too hurt by that contact that he had that sent Aaron Brown around as he's currently your race leader. Logan Clampett also a part of things up here as well. And Benjamin White trying desperately to make something happen in the outside line. As you can see on the right-hand side of your screen, one more look. Again, this were a couple of trucks that didn't fare necessarily so well through that green flag pit cycle. And oh my goodness, that is that is scary uh, right there. If you're that truck on the right-hand side, just trying to miss Aaron Brown coming back up onto the racetrack. But again, no caution thrown. We stay green. So Falkingham is now in control of this inside line. It's the first time that we've really talked about him much in this race. Not to say that he didn't have a plan. We figure with the amount of experience that he has between representing the University of Maine at Machias in the college series, and representing Joe Gibbs Racing and the Enascar Coca-Cola iRacing series, not a surprise that maybe the plan all along was to lead a little bit. But from 35th on the starting grid, he is now the race leader. It's Garrett Lowe controlling that middle lane into the outside Mario Miranda. And I also caught Logan Clampett is now up in the mix too and in the top 10. That's I think the last thing everybody else wanted to see that was trying to gain some points tonight. But the Cal State Fullerton Titan has damage on his front end. So I'm not convinced that that truck is going to be all that great of a leader, but it could push somebody to the win. Well, again, Garrett Lowe down the back stretch. He kind of poked high as if he wanted to block that outside lane. And I think he had second thoughts with how much momentum they were carrying. It was not going to work out. So he elected to stay back down in the middle. And it was enough for Miranda to go up to the front of the field and clear uh, that third lane down into the second lane. Uh, as we can see on board here, at least behind Daniel Falkingham's uh, JGR Interstate Batteries machine representing Maine that you see right there. Uh, on the spoiler and trying to talk things out with his team again he kind of jumped the whole field was back in 33rd was a part of that group that pit first they are four wide behind him though i don't know how long that's gonna last and you can see he's trying to just maybe get clear miranda to lead that second lane not gonna be able to do so low will jump up into that second line as well and try to lead it but as you can see four wide and still four wide further back in the pack a number of trucks james uh, that had initially not caught up and kind of got sparsed out when we had that little incident uh, where the caution was not thrown they have caught back up to this lead pack so it's about oh call it about 22 25 trucks rather that are a part of this battle for the win and with 16 laps to go anything could happen any one of them has a chance at a thousand dollars at the end of the night
it was Matthew Morton that was trying to lead that outside line a lap ago, and I find it fitting that Matthew Zwack, who not only won our most recent race in February at Darlington, but is also a Michigan man and a student at the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor, uh, would have the opportunity to go help the Ohio State driver and decided against it and figured that instead of helping my big rival, I'm going to go help out another Big Ten driver and Elliot White from Maryland and then make something of it himself entirely. So he waited behind White and now it's Wack who's parading that fourth lane all the way up top. Try to take a look at it one more time as Wack tried to make a fourth lane up there. Nothing going. We're going to see it one more time. Great shove there uh, to the back of Logan Clampett perfectly square keeps that inside lane rolling and just one more time you can see Aaron Brown and you, you kind of get a sense of how quickly things happen here at Talladega that you can just be riding around on the inside line minding your own business uh, giving some great shoves to try and move your line forward and then all of a sudden you have to check up and try to make a move around and because of that because of that move you can see Edward Sanchez still up here battling trying to get this race win with 15 laps to go you can see that third truck in the second lane is that number 26 is one car is around in the trioval. another one goes spinning into the inside wall caution flag is out as you can see abraham Bila gets the worst end of it hard contact with the inside retaining wall it was benjamin white as well who went through a spin uh, in the trioval. and all of a sudden with 14 laps to go we will bring everybody back on the lead lap into the fray and into the mix for this race win Benjamin White had one of the strongest trucks all race long, and now he's got a significant amount of left front damage on his Toyota Tundra, the Pensacola State College driver now in a world of hurt and going to need a lot of time on pit road to get that truck fixed. That may well take him out of contention for the win, and that's significant because White had been one of the few drivers that have been able to maintain the track position throughout the course of this race. That opening 30-lap stretcher show he was one of the few, along with the John Forbes and company, who was able to stay up in the top five pretty much the entirety of things. And then all of a sudden, now here he is in trouble late. We'll take a look at the replay. Vila in the blue and yellow car up on the outside, just tried to come down and was not clear and uh, just sort of got spun into Benjamin White. To White's credit, I don't think there's much that he could have done there, but Vela tried to clear himself and get down in the middle and Vela was not clear. That was the case. May have gotten a little bit of a bump that got him out of shape just behind from Matthews Wack. Second wreck that we've seen in the trioval tonight, James. This one brings out a caution. The previous one didn't. Uh, but this kind of sets up an interesting scenario. I'd imagine at this point that nobody's going to take the opportunity to come down and pit at this juncture. We'll see it one more time. Three wide in the pack. We saw a lot of four wide moves. And yeah, White goes up to the middle and makes a clean move. All of a sudden, he's hooked in the right rear. And you know, honestly, got to give some credit to uh, to White there, who, you know, you get hooked in the trioval. It could go much worse than that. Gets a little bit of a brush to the outside wall. But I would say he at least has a little bit of a fighting chance uh, to try and continue on in this race. Yeah, no, solid word from White there. A, a bummer that he ended up in the fence a little bit, but you're right. That could have been a whole lot worse. And you know, I've seen other wrecks in very similar positions end up much, much bigger than that. So credit to him. The, the problem, though, is that that truck is going to have all sorts of damage in the left front. And with as fast as you move here at Talladega, it increases the drag. It slows you down by yourself in a straight line. He'll have to likely be tucked up behind somebody to have a shot at victory, regardless of how much damage he can get repaired. Now, this being Talladega, you have some time to come down pit road. Pace laps are, you know, maybe two and a half minutes, but still not the place you want to find yourself in. And for more information on how to start your iRacing career, if you want to get involved with iRacing here, especially after that massive update that came just about a week ago, at the beginning of March, you can log on to iRacing.com today. And Blake, I think uh, for two of us who have been around the community for a while, I, I truly think that it is easier now than ever before to start your iRacing career because there's so many more tools, especially at that very, very beginning that you can use. When we started, we didn't have AI racing that you could use, but if, if you really wanted, you could set up some AI races and compete against computer drivers before you jump into an online real race. And if you want to practice racing with a group, and especially, you know, you want to practice plate racing and 
you know, get used to racing around other cars when you wouldn't necessarily have them if you were on your own in a test session. You could do that too. So it's easier now than ever before, and it's neat to see the tools that have been developed throughout the years to make it better. There's so many different ways that you can use iRacing now when you first start out than when in 2010, what, you could run Legends cars at South Boston and Lanier if you were an oval enjoyer. That was it. Uh, as we're going to take a look at uh, at the Barney cam up here at Talladega Super Speedway, and, oh, man, a couple of close calls. I think we've seen that a little bit earlier in the race as well uh, from that number 17 truck of Lane Graves for Wichita State. It's had a couple of close calls, and, you can see nearly just got sideswiped there a couple of times through the course of that. Um, but will find himself in the 21st position, and at least for now, uh, has a clean race truck uh, to continue and, and try to make something happen here in the last 12 or 11 laps or so. 12 to go now. Lights off on the pace car. 11 laps to go for these drivers, and the field is all bunched up. So at this point, Blake, I would figure that any sort of strategy to lay back is probably out of the window, but uh, you as the driver here between the two of us and the more accomplished one at that, if you're in the back of this pack, are you trying to make your move to get to the front now, or are you waiting off the thought that maybe there might be another wreck here, and it will be very different than uh, the next race that we have in the College Series, April 16th, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, enascar.com forward slash live from Nashville Super Speedway. I think the mentality has changed enough. To, and again, this is just a personal thing. I can't really speak for every single driver out here, but I would try to lead every single lap of this race. Not only do I think you just have to choose one or the other, you have to completely hang out in the back and hope for a wreck, or you just have to be first if you can. I would hate to know if I rode around here the last 12 laps and a caution didn't come out that I could have I, I maybe threw away the opportunity or the chance at some scholarship money because I thought something was going to happen that didn't. I would much rather take my own destiny into my own hands, try to make something happen. And guess what? If it doesn't work out and if you get wrecked, you know, so what? at least you, at least you tried. But uh, I think at this point, if I were holding the steering wheel, if I'm in 15th, am I, if I'm in second, I'm just trying as much as I can to get to the front, to control each lane, to try to make the aggressive moves that are necessary to stay up front. Because, again, I want a shot at this money, and I'd much rather have it in my own hands. So now here we go, 11 laps to go. Our own Blake McCandless is in the camp of a John Forbes or a Benjamin White. However, we don't have any of them up near the front of the field now. It's Garrett Lowe, it's Daniel Nanny, it's Mario Morenda, it's Logan Clamp, and it's Daniel Falkingham. Those are the drivers now pacing this field as Lowe slides up top and he's gonna get dumped on that outside line as Morenda powers through the middle to take the race lead. Well, that could be the downside there. Garrett Lowe tried to get up there in the middle, and Miranda was not having it. Unfortunately, Garrett Lowe in a good position to battle up here in the top five is going to continue falling back until one lonely truck may just try to jump up with him to the third lane. But it doesn't happen as Daniel Nanny now representing Ball State, the control room in Massachusetts. It's going wild right now as... Daniel Nanny tries to take the race lead up here at Talladega, and he may just cross the stripe with 10 to go in the race lead, and indeed he does. Nanny by maybe a hood length and a half. Miranda up on that outside lane, making it work, continuing to shuffle. We go break off the rear deck lid of the Ball State driver who's going to slide up to the oh, top man. and is oh. going to get turned in front of Mario Miranda. And he spins down to the inside wall, but they all spin to the apron, and we stay green flag racing. And Daniel Falkingham now controls the field. Again, that all happened off of the racing surface on the apron. All cautions are thrown by iRacing at this venture. So Daniel Falkingham will resume the race lead as the pack, for the most part, stayed together. But you can see them three forming up four wide further on back, trying to get their lane forward. They'll come around this time, nine laps to go. It's Falkingham and the 26 of Sanchez, who goes from seventh to first that time around. Gonna get a look at the replay here. You'll see what happened to Daniel Nanny and everything just got crazy at the front of the field. He tried to cut down in front of everyone and just again was not clear. Also, let's make note of the fact that Edward Sanchez, who had fallen back a little bit, our pole sitter, is now the one controlling the middle lane and Elliot White has control of the top line. 
Again, it was Miranda, Daniel Nanny, C.L. Smith, Colson Phelps, Aaron Mulrooney Jr., and about one or two others that lost the pack out of that move. Still up here at the front of the field, 21 trucks that are attached to this lead pack that all have their opportunity at $1,000 or a different prize pool if they're able to get up to the top 10. This time across, it'll be Falkingham who has the race lead, getting some great help behind him from a name we've mentioned many a time tonight, the 86 of Zach Sprouse. Eight to go. Third lane, though, starting to form, leading that one. It's that 31 Ohio State machine of Matthew Morton. Morton with a whole host of momentum. And how about this? If you like irony, let's make note of the fact that the Ohio State driver is getting a push from the Michigan driver to go to the race lead. Morton now drops to the middle. Matthew Swack is in control of that third lane on the outside. It's Sanchez who's got the middle. Looks like Austin Green has been able to make his way back up towards the front. But it's Swack who will carry that momentum up top and roll all the way on the high line through the trioval. Duck down to the middle. Will go all the way down and then thought better of it so he'll take the push from Sanchez ride that middle lane take the lead at the stripe and it'll be Michigan and Ohio State drivers leading the field into turn one as we've seen many a times Zwack going to go to the middle lane to try and hold on and keep that bottom lane at bay. Seven laps to go here at Talladega. It is Garrett Lowe now who's trying to lead the charge on that outside line and some other drivers that again are trying to make a fourth groove work. Not going to be able to work this time. Somewhat stalemated up here at the front of the field between Zwack and Lowe battling side by side for the lead. Look at Dylan Alt, the Sacramento State driver. We barely called his name, and he's a driver in the E-NASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series. He's now up at the front, second car in that high line, three lanes working against each other here as we approach the final six laps at Talladega. But Zwack in that middle lane, that tends to get a really good run through the trioval, and he'll lead the lap again ahead of Lowe, ahead of Sanchez, and ahead of Matthew Morton. An incredible turnaround for Matthew Zwack, who wasn't necessarily a part of the conversation for much of a portion of this race. However, down on the bottom, great run and great push from Falkingham, trying to just poke a nose of Matthew Morton's machine up front. I think the question is here, though, James, when do you make your move? Do you try to make it at five to go, six to go, or on the last lap? But right now, three wide throughout the pack. Look at Morton's whack. Falkingham is just tucked in there behind Morton as well. But again, Zwack with that great run. But here comes Garrett Lowe on the outside. The Gastonia, North Carolina native and the Charlotte 49er with a great run here. He and Morton will fight to the stripe at the line. It was Morton by 17 one thousandths of a second. Again, it's going to be those second and third trucks in lane that re in line that really make that front truck go. And right now, Garrett Lowe is getting some great help from behind in the form of Dylan Alt, as well as the 79. We haven't really talked about Austin Farr that much. Uh, you may think it's William Byron representing Liberty, but no, it is Austin Farr who is leading and trying to make some moves on the outside, but Lowe clears to the middle in front of whack. That inside lane stalled out just a little bit, and that's going to allow Garrett Lowe to take control of the line ahead of Matthew Morton. Dylan Alt now the driver up in that top lane, as it looks like. I think Lowe's going to try and hold middle. He almost shot all the way back up to the top side, but decided to take control of that central lane ahead of Matthews Whack. Garrett Lowe will lead the lap. Four laps to go at Talladega. Lowe in front by maybe a truck length, if that. Now remember, if you're Garrett Lowe, as he'll block Matthew Morton, he's trying to play the lanes. Remember how that worked out for Daniel Nanny. Remember how it worked out earlier in the race. We've seen a number of leaders try to control all three lanes, but you can only do so much. It's now coming up. Morton gets turned across the nose of Matthew Zwack. The rest of the field will pile in as the caution flag comes out with four laps to go as Morton tried to make a move on Lowe. Lowe went to block. Zwack was in the middle lane, and unfortunately, just gets turned in front of the field and much of the pack that was up here in the top 10 gets some form of damage in that one. With all due respect to both of them and their fan bases, I, I do find it a little bit poetic and fitting that this starts 
between a driver from Ohio State and Michigan. It was Wack and Morton who made contact. And given how much we know that uh, th there's no love lost between those two, uh, maybe not a huge surprise in that sense uh, that we have that as the center of all of this. But finally, a big wreck on the back straightaway that takes out maybe 10 or 15 trucks minimum and probably more than that and will shake up the running order significantly and maybe most importantly, Blake McCandless, green, white, checker racing is imminent. And that is really going to change the complexion of this race. We, we talked about so many of these drivers that came down pit road. We're talking about kind of a 33 or 34 lap pit window. I think at this point, you kind of run up against if we have uh, enough laps that we run under caution. If we have a couple of green-white checkers, is fuel going to become part of the conversation as well? But take a look at what happened here. Zwack is getting shoved there from the 26 of Sanchez. And, you know, I think Morton just trying to get to the outside. He's looking more out the windshield, trying to get to the outside of Garrett Lowe to make a move. And unfortunately, Zwack, who's, you know, he's holding his ground there in the second lane. He was outside and unfortunately turns Matthew Morton. And again, when a wreck like this happens at the front of the field, there's so many, oh, so many places to go. Uh, but you can get through if you're Benjamin White, apparently, and, and not get scraped up too bad as he finds himself in the top 10. I also find it wonderful that oh, only maybe two minutes later that our producer comes in our ear and he makes the same observation that I did right off the bat that it's Michigan Ohio State that got into one another. So uh, I that, wouldn't let a black guy up it. in the middle lane. Yeah, no, I, I I get it. Although in in defensive zwack here, as I look back at all this, you had Edward Sanchez pushing him, but there were about three or four trucks, and, and Blake, I think you made a point of it. There were about three or four trucks behind zwack that were just as tucked up underneath him as he was when he made contact with Matthew Morton. So I don't even know if you could totally pin that on Zwack because if Zwack doesn't turn him, then Sanchez would have, or I think Lane Graves was also in that line. It was only about maybe 10th or 12th in that pack that everybody was that far spread out to where they weren't you know, immediately connected, but that's what you have to do in the final five laps of these races. You have to push like that because if you don't, somebody else will and somebody else is going to go to victory lane it's a great point and sometimes you're just along for the ride if you're that first or second truck in line and you know those, those early race moves that guys would check up for you're not necessarily looking uh right at people making contact third fourth fifth truck in line a lot of that goes by the wayside uh, when we get to these late race situations and that's where a lot of, of that chaos is going to start because you have drivers that are you know, maybe fourth in line on the inside or in the middle lane, and they're, they're not going to have any patience. They, they don't necessarily have any reason to care about the truck in front of them either. That's, you know, 50 or $100 or even more per position uh, that they help out that truck in front of them, and they're trying to get all their scholarship money uh, that they can at this point. Uh, but we're going to come around this time, three to go. We are in a green-white checkered scenario. And again, I, I know we're probably a couple of cautions away from talking about this playing into factor, James, but I have to wonder at, th at this point, if we continue to run under caution, green, white checkers, are we going to run into a situation where fuel could become part of the conversation? A lot of these drivers pitted around lap 35 or 36 or so, probably not going to have to worry about it if we get one, but if we get to two and perhaps if we get to three, a lot of drivers up here at the front of the field that were not willing to give up their track position to go to the back, uh, they, they may be on fumes uh, trying to get to the end of this thing. So there are your green-white checker rules there. You get three attempts to finish under green, and if we get a yellow before the white, then we'll re-rack them and do it again. Here's a, another final look there, and I guess your conclusive proof that Michigan and Ohio State got into it there. You've got a good screenshot of it there, courtesy of our wonderful production team with iRacing that helps bring you all the pictures and graphics that you see on your screen as well. Also worth noting here, before we go back green flag racing, I want to take a question from the Twitch chat on iRacing. Keslash asks, 
do these drivers decide on a college where they may already have seats or are they already at the college and then enter? And for the most part, it's these drivers who already have some racing experience that are representing their schools. But we've seen a few programs like, like Ball State. Auburn's a great example. They've got three drivers in the field tonight. Uh, UNC Charlotte is another one where we're seeing, uh, especially a lot of engineering programs, develop sim racing programs because the training that you get in sim racing can help you with your real life engineering. So uh, there's much more crossover in symbiosis now than there's ever been. And I only think that's going to get better. Well, again, I think simulation, it, you, you look at any form of racing and motorsports uh, across the globe and simulation has become such a big part of how drivers, how teams, how engineers, how crew chiefs, everybody involved uh, in race teams uh, prepare uh, for their real life action. And uh, I think, you know, the, the sim world has kind of followed suit that everybody has seen the utility that it could be to build better setups uh, to help drivers become fam more familiar uh, with racetracks before they ever get there in real life. There's so much crossover and I think uh, a lot of these college programs are seeing the utility of that as uh, this industry continues to evolve. Green flag out on a first green white checker. Garrett Lowe, Kealoga Hankins to Charlotte. 49ers lined up, nose to tail to lead that bottom line as they go back to one. Again, about three trucks or so breaking away at the front of each line. There were some stack ups there from about 10th on back that kind of broke apart each of the inside and the outside lane. As they finally get up to full song, they'll eclipse 180 miles an hour here down the Alabama gang super stretch. If they get back to the white flag, it would be official, but it is still low and Falkingham side by side for the lead. Nate Stewart got a huge run and gave a shot to John Forbes Jr. who's back up in the picture behind Daniel Falkingham's second truck on that outside lane. If we get the white flag here, we'll have one lap to go and it'll be whatever happens in this last lap is whatever happens. It could be chaotic. It could be a race to the line. We'll see how it goes. But Garrett Lowe just about got turned and saved it twice. And Hankins hits the wall as they all start wrecking. But we cross the start finish line before the white or rather after the white flag came out. So as they all wreck, it is this three truck race, Blake, for the win. Only three trucks last as they continue to wreck in turns one and two. It is low, it is Falkingham, and it is Elliott White, the third truck in line for Maryland, that's going to go to the outside. Low looks down to the bottom. Falkingham making his truck as wide as he possibly can. Three horse show here at Talladega. One lap to do it. Garrett Lowe peeks to the outside. Elliot White decides to go up top with Garrett Lowe, and that will leave Falkingham high and dry as White and Garrett Lowe are first and second. Can Elliot White get a run in the trial bull and catch back up to Garrett Lowe to steal the race when he goes high and blow blocks just a little bit. Three wide at the line. Garrett Lowe, your winner of round number seven of the E-NASCAR College iRacing Series powered by a Star League at Talladega by 28 one thousandths of a second. It's a scenario you don't run into too often, but yet I think we saw that experience and having that sim racing background, having that e NASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series background helped in the clutch as three trucks escaped. So much different than having an entire pack around you, but the moves that were made, again, low was in a vulnerable spot, leading like he was there on the last lap. So was Falkingham, and Elliot White had an incredible position to be in as he was trying to run down your two race leaders there on the last lap. But Garrett Lowe got the lead exactly when he needed to. He made the necessary blocks. And Garrett Lowe, who will make up a significant portion, in fact, maybe leading the championship standings when it's all said and done, will come around to the start-finish line and enjoy his Coca-Cola winning moment. Indeed, the winning moment of tonight's race here, the E-NASCAR Coca or rather uh, college I racing series <laughs> brought to you by Coca-Cola, the official fan refreshment of E NASCAR as Garrett Lowe representing the University of North Carolina at Charlotte brings it home once again. One of the top drivers in this series throughout the past few seasons and he survived the carnage up front and played a very interesting sort of strategy setup. I know Blake you've dealt with that a lot in hosted sessions where you'll have crazy last lap wrecks and then you've got maybe two or three drivers perhaps 
but sneak it through. And it's it's a different sort of strategy that you have to play, but Lowe's had enough experience to do exactly what to do. So we take a look at our Coca-Cola move of the race. It really just comes all down to being patient and knowing exactly when to make the right move. And again, this is coming to the white flag. And look how aggressively they are shoving these trucks, second, third, fourth trucks in line. And low, I mean, what an incredible save. That's got to be the move of the race where he hangs on to that truck as they're coming across the white flag. Falkingham had taken it at that point. So again, the race is official and we go all the way to the checkered flag. Now, Lowe has to look in his mirror. He knows that Elliot White is is going to have a run and he's going to have to at least push one of them he elects to go with low he goes low he goes high he's looking for some way around daniel falkingham and he's at this point you're kind of relying on elliot white to go with you instead of falkingham and he's able to do it here all the way around to the top of turn four elliot white went with him I also think the Garrett Lowe, and we'll talk to him here in just a little bit, but I have to believe he's going to give some credit to Elliot White, too, because if Elliot White does not decide to go with him in turn three, the likelihood is very high that Daniel Falkingham is the winner of this race instead of Garrett Lowe. It was that push from White that got Lowe out front and gave him the opportunity to make the blocks he needed to to take the win. Also worth noting that for the uh, continued tales of how much we've wanted to see Testudo make an appearance on Elliott White's machine since he's represented the University of Maryland for more than a few times in the college series, I noticed Testudo on the deck list. So Elliot, your painters, good job. More Testudo is always a good thing. Let's go to our race winner, Blake McCandless, standing by with our victor out of Gastonia, North Carolina, for UNC Charlotte, Garrett Lowe. Garrett, that was a wild race. That was an incredible finish. What in the world happened there on the last lap when you guys took the white flag? And just walk us through that entire last lap. Yeah, I kind of almost thought it was over. Uh, you know, 72, Kilo was doing a great job pushing. Uh, I have class with him tomorrow, so I owe him a big handshake uh, for the push. He did a great job. Uh, we just, everyone was start, starting to side draft there through the tri-oval. And uh, once that happened, everyone just started kind of dooring and o almost sent us all around. Um, and then coming to the checker was just a matter of time in the run and, and being at the front when it mattered. Well, I know you take a lot of pride in rep representing the University of Charlotte. I know you had a lot of, a lot of students, a lot of fans. Uh, at the NASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series Championship a year ago. So being able to, to take this win, be able to take home uh, the greatest amount of scholarship money from this night, how much does that mean to you? Yeah, it means a lot. Um, hey, everybody over in the Quickie Lab watching tonight. Um, hope that was a good enough show for you guys. Uh, finally got a college series win. Thank goodness. Took us long enough. Uh, don't know how many tries that took, but it took a while. Uh, yeah, just really appreciate it. Um, college series and NASCAR for putting this on. Uh, it's a great way to generate a little extra scholarship money um, that ultimately helps me pay for racing because I'm paying less for school. Uh, so appreciate that. And uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully have another good run in a couple weeks or whenever, whenever the next one is. You guys are at Nashville Super Speedway in a couple of weeks with two races left. I believe you're now the points leader uh, when it's all said and done for this semester. So Garrett, congratulations and. Again, an eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series winner, now a College Series winner at Talladega tonight. Congratulations, Garrett. Thank you, guys. See you next time. Move over to Daniel Falkingham. Came up just shy of being able to take the race win of his own, and I'll kind of lead off with you just like I did with Garrett there. Last lap, that was just absolute chaos. You're able to escape that wreck. What's kind of going through your mind is you kind of realize it's going to be a three truck race up to the end of this one. Yeah, uh, going when well, we took the white, I see I think it was Gilo got knocked down of the apron or whatever. There was a lot of pushing going on, and then I see them all wrecking, so I kind of swerved high and make sure I didn't get hit in the left rear. And then J I had JD Laird in my ear telling me there's it's only like a three truck race, so it was kind of similar to Daytona when when it was a me and Burrow was racing for the win, but. And uh, I just did all I could to try to block g -Lo and block all him behind me. I blocked him once, but I couldn't block him two times. And just g -Lo, he had a push for, I believe it was Elliot, and I was just, I was just hung out to dry. And that's, that's just the way it goes in this super speedway stuff. So, uh, but uh, very relieved to uh, come home third. Well, we 100% podium rate so far in all the races I've done. So, uh, but yeah, just a matter of just being hung out there and not just going to do much there. But we'll, we'll take a third place, though.
I know you do a lot of competition here on iRacing, but again, not uh, so much as as lucrative as this. How much uh, has it helped you to not only win some tonight, but throughout this college iRacing series that it's been able to kind of uh, help you get through school, through school a little bit? How cool is that? Yeah, it's helped me a lot. Start doing this uh, just over a year ago. Start at the end of 2022, start the 2022 year. And uh, I've been very fortunate to have a lot of good races and to make up some tuition money, which has really helped me in the long run. And especially with how my college stuff is going on right now, I should be done around the end of the year. So this is kind of like my last few races doing this. So I'm just enjoying it as much as I can. I love coming out and just coming out to support the series. And I love for what NASCAR, iRacing, and Nate Star League. Appreciate all those guys for putting on this series. And it's, it's been a blast. I've been very fortunate to have a lot of good results over here. Even a couple of wins, too. But uh, a couple more races left to get a few more wins, hopefully. Yeah, you got two races left, although that graduate degree may want to take a look at that. You'll be able to hang around a little bit longer uh, here at the Enos yeah. College High Racing Series. But, uh, Daniel, congratulations on third tonight. I'm sure we'll see you a lot going forward. Yep, thanks, Mike. Y'all have a good one. So. Your final running order here in the E-NASCAR College iRacing Series, powered by Nace Star League from Talladega. Garrett Lowe, again, 28 one thousandths of a second. The Charlotte 49er beats the Maryland Terrapin and the University of Maine at Machias. As Daniel Falkenham round out the podium. Edward Sanchez from pole to P4 at Talladega at a plate track. Not a bad run for him or Baruch. Brendan Schulenberger from Winget rounded out the top five. Garrett Vitton made it two Garretts in the top ten. He represents Arizona State. Paul State's Kelton Quick was seventh. Alexander Hyder from St. John's River Community College was eighth. Guilford's Charles Wimley ninth. And Cal State Fullerton's Logan Clampett rounds out the top ten to keep that championship bid alive. A little further back and again you could see the separation amongst all of these drivers and just how much that last wreck really played into factor john forbes jr brings it home 11th lane graves brought it home in 12th uh, mario miranda had a great shot to win this race finishes in 13th tonight reese baham in 14th austin far in 15th dylan alt is also kind of pu pushing his teammate there at the end trying to make some moves brings it home in 16th tonight uh, Kaloa Hankins in 17th, another Charlotte 49er uh, that nearly uh, was the difference in getting Garrett Lowe a win tonight. Logan Smith in 18th, 19th was Jeremy Burns, and Matthew Morton rounded out the top 20 after getting spun late. As Garrett Lowe said, Kaloa Hankins was a big factor with that push right at the white flag and to getting into victory lane. Anthony Burroughs, 21st, Aaron Mulroney Jr., 22nd, Jonathan Evans, Jose Solis Jr., and Matthew Zwack, the top 25, Aaron Brown, Abraham Vila, Austin Green, Nate Stewart, Landon Vilecki, top 30. Chris Bryant, Daniel Nanny had a shot to win, unfortunately brings home in 32nd, Colson Phelps, Benjamin White, Colton Salick, Zach Sprouse, Caleb Bryan, Jack Clemens, and James Scioli. Rounds out your 39 truck field tonight for the E-NASCAR College iRacing Series at Talladega. James, we knew it was gonna be chaotic. We knew there was a lot of opportunity, but at the end of the night, some familiar names up front that ended up taking home the prize money and the win uh, tonight at Talladega. It goes back to a point you made earlier. Yes, there's chaos. Yes, it can be unpredictable, but there is a skill set that comes with being successful at freight tracks and the people who finished up near the front. Not a surprise that they're there. One more race in the regular season for the college series. April 16th. We're back at it Tuesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern, enascar.com forward slash live. Nashville Super Speedway and the vehicles of the NASCAR Xfinity Series. One more opportunity to get yourself into the final race, the championship race at Homestead Miami Speedway on May 3rd. So crunch time for the drivers on the bubble trying to make their way in. For all of our partners at eNASCAR, Nash Star League and company, for our director Drew Adamson and our wonderful production team behind the scenes at iRacing, and for my colleague in the booth, Blake McCandlish, I am James Pike. Thank you so much for watching iRacing's coverage of the eNASCAR College iRacing Series powered by Nate Star League from Talladega. Congratulations to our winner from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte Garrett Lowe. And we'll see you on April 16th, one more time in the regular season from Nashville Super Speedway.